You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Welcome to another episode of the Revision Path Podcast. I'm Maurice Cherry, and this week's episode is brought to you by our sponsors, MailChimp and Audible. MailChimp is more than just an email service provider. They're also a company that strongly supports the creative community. So why not support a company that supports us? Visit them at MailChimp.com today, sign up for a free account, and transform your email marketing. Audible has a huge library of over 150,000 audiobooks available right at your fingertips. Right now, I'm listening to Profit First by Mike Michalowicz. It's a really great book for entrepreneurs. Highly recommend checking that out. Visit audibletrial.com forward slash revision path and listen for free and get a 30 day free trial. Can't get any easier than that. Shout out to Net Magazine for the Generate NYC giveaway we had last week and for the great interview that I did with them over at Creative Block. Uh, you can check out our Facebook page for the link to that. And also a shout out to Referral Candy for featuring us in their recent post about diversity in the startup scene. We're in great company with other sites and organizations like Black Girls Code, Hack the Hood, Model View Culture, and more. So definitely check that out. Now, in order for us to continue to provide these great interviews to you, we really need your help. If you like these podcasts and find the interviews and information that you learn useful, then go to tugboatyards.com forward slash page forward slash revision path and donate today. Even a penny will help. Revision Path is a listener-supported project that is growing every day, as you can see, and we really can't do it without you. Now let's get to this week's interview. I talked with Eric Johnson, a senior UX designer in Oakland, California. Here we go. All right, so tell us who you are and what you do. My name is Eric Johnson, and I am presently a senior user experience designer. Now, what exactly is user experience design for those that might be listening and want to get some more information about that? Well, in my opinion, user experience design is more of what the, well, it's it's almost what it's, it's called. It's basically what the end user sees and how they interact with whatever you're designing or developing and, you know, how that plays out as far as the ease of use, colors, flow, sort of interactive elements. But basically, it's it's what the user gets to see and sort of tailoring that experience. How did you get involved with user experience design? User experience design for me came through just sort of my path through design as a whole. Initially, I would say I was more along the lines of a graphic designer. You know, I did, uh-huh. I did a lot of sort of elaborate pieces for advertising and things like that. And over time, I eventually sort of broke into the web world, and mm-hmm. that just became my, my focus. When did that first spark for design come from you? Did you get it in college? Did you get it earlier on? For design, I would have to say that started back when I was a kid. I was always like the art kid in school. I was always the one that had like a sketch pad in their book bag. I have to give a shout out to my mom (laughs) because she greatly encouraged me to be creative and do art because she saw that it was something I enjoyed. So she sort of had that spark and then sort of pushed me to continue in it all the time. And even now as an adult, she still sort of encourages me to draw and things like that. But I got into doing artwork, a lot of character drawing and sketching and things like that. And I got to a point where the web was sort of more accessible and becoming a little bit more prevalent. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to figure out how I could get people to see my drawings because right now they were just sitting in sketch pads and I, I wanted the world to see that, oh, I have some actual talent drawing. So I learned about, you know, scanning my photos and putting them into Photoshop, which was at the time like Photoshop 4 or something like okay. that. And then it was more like, okay, now that I've got these on my computer, 
how do I color them? Because, you know, the colors in my pad don't represent, like, how I want them to finally look. So I've, I learned how to, you know, color my drawings and how to, to darken up the lines and do all that work. And then it was like, okay, where do I put them? <laughs> I need a website. So at the time, I was, I was still, at this point, I was still in high school, so I had to figure out how to make websites. So I could put up the drawings that I had just figured out how to edit in Photoshop. So that was just me basically finding the websites that I liked, viewing the source and like blatantly stealing it and tearing it apart until I figured out how all of it worked and then making it my own. And from there, I just sort of continued with this sort of wonder of the internet and building websites and doing design and it just sort of kept going and building up yeah i think they would call that that reverse engineering now that kind of thing where you look at a site try to figure out what it is and then work backwards to get to it because back then in the 90s i mean there was no smashing magazine there were no there was no lynda.com or anything like that so a lot of what we learned really had to come from doing that kind of you know exploration and digging through and trying to figure out the code. Yeah, that, that was definitely the case. It took like a while before I could say I was proficient in any form of HTML because there was so much that I would sort of stumble upon online. It's like, well, I didn't even know I could do this. How do I do it? All oh, this code doesn't look so hard to deal with. I'll just keep plugging in. Oh, the site's broken now, so I guess I did that wrong. And It was more just like trial and error and you just kind of kept going until I figured out how to do it right. Okay. Now, you mentioned your mom. Did you have any other mentors that kind of helped you along the way? My dad, he's provided basically like the, I would say the tech part of my sort of learning experience because he got me into computers. He got a computer for us back when it was, I think my first one was like a 486 uh-huh. And I was just so enamored with the computer when he got it. Like it was constructed because buying a, a computer outright then was just so expensive. But I just became enamored with that, and that part uh, it was part of what kept me sort of interested in technology. So I mean, I could have gone the more general art direction with drawing and painting and things like that. But sort of the introduction of the computer into the household morphed that whole sort of sensibility of what I wanted to do Mm art-wise. But I think, like, really early on, I didn't have any influences because there wasn't anyone around me doing this. I didn't really have sort of a grasp for who was like the person to watch in the space either. Mm -hmm. So it was more of, I was just inspired by anything that was new and different than what I had already known or seen. That was sort of how I built up what was interesting to me, what tailored what I wanted to learn and what sort of focused me on what was like the next sort of trick or technique that I wanted to figure out was just what was different than what, I was already doing. Now, you mentioned earlier, before we got started, you mentioned that you're in Oakland. Now, did you grow up in Oakland, too? No, I did not. I grew up in Maryland. Specifically spent most of my life in Fort Washington, Maryland. I was born in D.C., though, but we moved to Maryland when I was younger. Fort Washington, probably like five, ten minutes outside of D.C., also five to ten minutes outside of Virginia. So the DMV is what most people on the East Coast would probably know it as. Okay. So you you had that spark. Your mom was encouraging you. Your dad brought a computer into the house. So you kind of had that exposure to, I guess not really design per se, but you at least had that exposure to technology and how you could use it. Yeah. From there, you went to Bowie State. Can you tell us about that? Bowie State. What can I tell you about that? I, I, <laughs> I honestly can't tell you much about it. I mean, and by by that, I mean, when I was going to Bowie State, I went to, you know, go to class. Mm-hmm. 
And then that was sort of the extent of college for me. Like I went there, I went to whatever part-time job I was working at the time after that. And then I went home. Like for me, I was in that phase of, I'm sort of, I guess you could say I was grinding out, trying to figure out this whole sort of internet and design thing. I was more focused on other things. So college just was like, oh, I'm going here for classes. Oh, class is over. I'm out of here. See you later. I wasn't living on campus. I was living at home. I was had a vehicle, so I was out and about doing other things. But just to me, it was just school. It was just a continuation of high school, really. Was it because it was so close to where you were geographically? Like I know for sometimes it feels that way when you go off to college that's in the same kind of area where you are, it feels like 13th grade. Yeah, I think that's part of it. And I mean, and I, I may need to preface this before I say this because like user experience may vary, but. <laughs> okay, your mileage may vary. Yes. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed more of a a case of, These are people that I see all the time. It's like, you know these people. These are the kind of people you've been interacting with most of your life. And it feels like, well, this can't be all there is to life is these same people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes going to historically black university is not necessarily what you should do. I know some people prefer to do that. It may be like a family thing and you want to keep that tradition, Mm -hmm. but the real world isn't necessarily that those people around you. It's going to be a huge diversity pool when you get into the real world. And sometimes that sort of feeling you get when you're just surrounded by the same people, you may get a little bit more accustomed to that and not willing to explore. So when you finish school, you're like, okay, I'm comfortable with these people. I'm comfortable in this place. I'm going to stay here. I'm not going to, oh, well, I'm, I'm not going to go to Canada and check that out. Or I'm not going to go explore Europe because I'm not used to that. That's not what I'm, that's not my comfort zone. Mm-hmm. And I sort of quickly figured out that this was something that I didn't want to continue. So I sort of didn't. <laughs> I was going to say, so with all of knowing all that, that's why you ended up leaving. That and I was actually teaching myself more than what I was learning in class. Like there were Mm. classes that I was basically, I basically showed up and I would show up for tests. And that would be the extent of it because like the curriculum, I had already taught myself over the summer or something like that. Or I'm already like months ahead because... What I was doing was I was just spending my time, you know, reading books and exploring what I could figure out on my own and basically getting ahead of everybody. So Mm -hmm. I just got so frustrated waiting for the ability to get into like the serious courses that it just it was just like, I can't take this anymore. I'm I can do this myself. I don't necessarily need this instruction at this point. There's not anything that you guys are going to teach me that I can't learn in less time. Now, how did your parents take that? My mom is still pretty pissed about that. And she, <laughs> and she really, really wants me to continue. My dad is a little bit more understanding, but my mom is not going to let this go ever. But I mean, now you're, you're successful now in your career. She is still not going to let it go. Wow. Moms can really be like that. They still want you because I guess it feels like it's a security thing and something to fall back on. It's like a set of credentials where if what you have now doesn't work out, you can still do this because you have a degree like the degree is like a, a safety net sort of. Yeah, I mean, I think she just really wants me to finish it. I think it was like she knows that I could easily have completed it if I wanted to. And I think she just wants me to follow through on that. It's not necessarily that she doesn't think that I'm going to get some kind of missing skill set out of going. I think she just wants me to sort of follow through and complete, to sort of grab that last sort of ring and finish that off. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, just check it off the list, yeah. sort of. So earlier you had talked about HBCUs, and you were saying that, you know, the reason that 
or you should say that the reason that people shouldn't well, let me let me try to phrase this the right way. You were mentioning about how HBCUs and why people would go because it's a lot of the same thing. It's that level of familiarity. Right. So because you were at Bowie State and you felt like you were getting more instruction outside of the school, what happened after you left? Where did you what did you end up doing? After I left, so while I was going to college, I actually had a part-time job where I was doing design. So I was actually applying what I was teaching myself. And it was for a small company in Virginia, but I was, you know, actually putting forth everything that I was thinking in my head, like, I can learn this, I can do this now, I don't need to wait. And it was sort of being proven to me at the time. But while that was going on, I was sort of getting into the mindset of, I think I can do much more than what I'm currently doing at this part-time job. So I started to look for a full-time job, which sort of also added to the fact that I was planning on, you know, stopping school. Mm -hmm. Was that your your first big design gig doing that? The the part-time job or the job that I was looking for? The job that you were looking for? Yes, that was like the first big job. And what were you doing there? That first job was actually at AOL. And that was back when AOL really mattered. Like it was still sort of a heavyweight <laughs> in the space. Uh huh. Yeah. So that was actually a pretty big deal for that to be like my first real job, at least in my opinion. And since then, you've worked at a, a number of big companies. You mentioned AOL, but you've worked at Adobe, you've worked at TripIt, you've worked at Walmart. What's it like being a designer working with such well known brands like that? The thing is, I think each one of these brands sort of has their own different culture and different set of politics that go along with it. Some of them, it's actually a lot easier to get things accomplished than you would ever think. And in other places, it's just as difficult and just as sort of timely and politics driven as you would expect as well. Mm -hmm. But realistically... Outside of the, I guess, the final decision making, if you can get around what you have to do to get something signed off on, the main focus for me was the team that I worked with. And if those people understood what was going on and how to get work accomplished and we worked well together and communicated great, then the level of politics and outside sort of interference really didn't matter because it made my work enjoyable and I knew Mm -hmm. that if we worked as a team we'd have each other back so if there was like if we wanted to argue a a point of something and we knew we were valid at least there was more voices than one person trying to argue in a meeting why something should be done a particular way Mm -hmm. now you're out there in Oakland you do you work in Oakland or you work in San Francisco I work in San Francisco it's just okay it's more convenient for me and more affordable for me to live in (laughs) Oakland than San Francisco Tell me about the San Francisco, I guess, design scene. I feel like there's so much conversation around not just tech in this country, but design as well, that centers in and around San Francisco and Silicon Valley. So what is the the design scene like there? Well, out here, it's sort of a weird thing because as a designer – I don't really know a lot of designers. Like I know more, uh, the the talent pool is majorly tipped in the side of engineering. So I know a ton of, of engineers. I know a handful of designers. A lot of companies out here are always looking for designers or so I hear. So there's plenty of companies looking all the time. But from the designers I do know, it's actually really fun because... The space sort of changes so quickly that you could be working on, like a lot of us started in websites and then a lot Mm -hmm. of us now are focused mostly on mobile applications. So you may come in with one skill set, but you'll quickly find out that you need to sort of be open to learning more than just that. I think being a designer out here, you're forced to be a more well-rounded designer because you could end up at a company with four people and you need to feel like 
three roles that they can't afford to hire for at the moment. Mm-hmm. So you're going to need to be able to pick up the slack. You're going to need to be agile. You're going to need to make sacrifices. And as much, as much as people come into design with egos, you kind of got to leave that shit at the door because yeah. you are quickly going to find that there are a million others waiting for your job and ego is not going to be sort of the the thing that's going to get you noticed. You, it'll probably be the thing that gets you fired or gets you hated in the community and sort of like branded this horrible person to deal with. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you have to be open. You have to be willing to learn. You have to be a good listener. Also, one thing I would which should suggest to all designers, well, yeah, all designers, learn something about code. You don't necessarily have to be able to program in PHP or Java or, you know, Objective-C, but be able to communicate with developers and understand what they're talking about and be able to recognize limitations in design because, oh, the page width has to be X size or we have these responsive points in the design. Be able to just sort of understand that terminology at the least because Mm -hmm. it's going to take you a lot farther than, oh, I can make nice designs and hopefully the developers can implement them. And if they have a problem, I don't know what to say. It's it's good that you mentioned that. I know that there's always been this this conversation behind where the designers should be specialists or if they should have kind of a more – varied skill set because I still encounter designers that all they know how to do is make pretty stuff in Photoshop. That's it. You ask them to try to put it on the web in some sort of way. They don't know HTML. They don't know CSS. And they're kind of offended that you even ask them. It's like, you know, I'm an artist. I made this in Photoshop or After Effects or whatever. But it seems like from what you're saying, it's good that you sort of know both sides because within a, a company, you're often going to be tasked to do something that's just outside of that perfunctory design role, so to speak. Yes, I think in a lot of the roles that I've worked in, having that sort of front-end developer knowledge definitely shined when it came to them sort of choosing a candidate for the role. My ability Mm -hmm. to talk to developers and my ability to understand the problems they might be having is something I use like daily. Like basically I'm entrenched with the engineering team. Like I'm a designer, but I hang out more with the engineers at my company than I do with the other designers. Are there any sort of specific industry trends that are going on right now that you just wish would go away? Oh, trends that I wish would go away... I think I would like to see, hmm, that's a really good question. (laughs) I don't know. I mean, as much as I am ingrained in like mobile technology and things like that, I tend to sort of stray away from actually using it. Like I don't have like a ton of apps. I have a ton of apps on my phone. A lot of it is more for me to sort of see what's going on and understand what People have figured out how to do and what, you know, technology is being exploited these days. But for the most part, <laughs> I tend to avoid, like, popular apps like the plague, like Snapchat, stuff like that. I, I kind of despise the idea of that app. Huh? I use Instagram and things like that, but that's only because I'm into photography. I like working with photos. But I think... I couldn't tell you what I, what trends I want to go away because it's probably something I'm already ignoring anyway. <laughs> Have you heard of this new app? I think it just came out this week called Yo. Yes, and did you also see that it was hacked? <laughs> yes, I did. Yes. I thought the, the, the thing that I took away from that is who is the, the person or persons that – gave $1 million to this app, and it it serves one purpose. I don't understand it. Like It's like Facebook poke without Facebook, which <laughs> makes it infinitely more annoying because the Facebook poke itself was already annoying because the only thing you can do is just tap someone's name, and it says, yo. Like Yeah, I think that's probably what 
and like in the back of my head instantly turned me off of it because I made that assessment in my head. Like this is just sort of how can I be re annoying to somebody? Like we've gotten past the pokes and that's all dead, but somebody's figured out how to bring it back. Right. Well, this kind of, I think this speaks to, well, first of all, the fact that they got a million dollars in funding and then in the same week it got hacked is just brilliant schadenfreude. Like, I know that money moves around in the valley pretty swiftly when it comes to things like this, but this is almost Shakespearean. It's it's pretty interesting. But sort of speaking on that, I know that a lot of people talk about innovation and things that come out of Silicon Valley more so being only for the benefit of people that are in Silicon Valley. I think the the way that I heard it was that it's a bunch of 20-something white guys solving problems for other 20-something white guys. And it sort of neglects how technology impacts us as a whole, like outside of the Valley, outside of the U.S., you know, how does it impact altogether? And with that, there's always been this talk of diversity in Silicon Valley, diversity in the community. Google, LinkedIn, Yahoo have all recently released reports that show sort of the breakdown of their employees, like they have this many male, this many Asian, black, what have you. Can you speak on sort of what the diversity is like in the community there? Well, there's a large diversity. The problem is, as everyone probably already knows, there's a huge lack of a female presence in tech. Mm -hmm. But there's an even smaller presence of African-Americans in tech, as far as I've seen. Like, in most of those companies that you've named that I work at, I am maybe black person, one of two or one of three, maybe, in the wow. in the groups that I work in. And some of these are like major companies. Uh-huh. Like there is diversity, but among African Americans and women, it's probably the smallest group. There's a large presence of Indian and Middle Eastern. There's a larger presence of you know Asian, but the, I mean, the majority is is the the white male twenty something that you mentioned. That is pretty much Silicon Valley, you know. Yeah. If you, if you were to summarize it, I mean, I know that sounds terrible, but that's that's a fact. Like you can't even ignore the numbers that are being put out by these major companies. It's like that's what it is. And mm-hmm. there is there is a group that says that there is I don't know if it's racism or that the, just the opportunities aren't there. I think the opportunities are there. I think that I don't know that the African-American group is just sort of, if that is, I don't know that it's, it's sexy to them. Like, is that what you hear kids coming out of school saying, oh, I want to go, you know, be a graphic designer? Is that, or I want to be a developer? I'm not sure that that's what schools in D.C. are sort of, helping kids understand that that's totally a viable job that you can make very good living off of. I mean, Mm. I think a lot are realizing that now, but it's like after the fact. It's like you're letting all of these other groups get a leg up on you when you could have just as easily been the person that made X app that, you know, was bought for a billion dollars. But I'm not sure that the public schools are sort of educating the options to kids. And as far as like people saying that there's racism or there isn't, there very well might be. And just because it's not experienced or out and open doesn't mean it's not going on. I can't claim it myself because I've been very fortunate to get into some of these major companies without any issues. And I've never had issues with anybody I've ever worked with, but that's not to say it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. I think that it is it is sort of that pipeline problem where, like you said, kids in school don't know that these are viable options that they can even take, so they may end up going another route before they sort of get back into what they're interested in if it is design. Like I can speak for myself. <laughs> when I was in high school, I wanted to major in English because I wanted to write, and my mom would say, oh, you know, you can't get a job with that. You need to get – need to." take like a real major. And I didn't really know what school I wanted to go to. I ended up going to Morehouse mainly because they paid me. (laughs) They gave me the best scholarship and I said, okay, I'll take it. 
and I was so eager to get out of where I was that I just it was the first thing I decided to do. And during my first semester there, that's when I realized I wanted to do web design. And I remember going to my advisor and talking to him and telling him, you know, I know we're learning C++ and all this stuff, but I really want to learn about the web. I feel like the web is sort of where things are going. I want to learn about HTML. And I don't even know if CSS was out at this time. This was like 99 or so. But I was telling him these things. And then he's like, oh, you should probably change your major because you're not going to find that here. And I had no idea <laughs> what I was going to change my major to because I'm like, I certainly don't want to stay in computer science and be miserable. And the only other option that I had to do was math. But then I was thinking, well, what if I went to the Art Institute? Because I always had an interest in art and design and things like that. But, of course, my scholarship wouldn't transfer. That would be thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year. I stayed. I got my math degree. But eventually I did come back around to design, which is what I'm doing now. I'm just wondering, like, if I would have known back then that this is a viable option and these are, you know, people you can talk to and these are things you could get involved with, I probably would have ended up going to design school. But I know there are organizations now like Black Girls Code and All Stars Code that are looking to focus sort of with kids on that level where they're at now in primary school or secondary school. So they do know that these are options that they can take. So I think it's starting to improve. The tide is definitely starting to turn. Well, yes, definitely. I mean, I'm finding that there's more young people that sort of know about the industry these days than in the past. And they realize that, you know, this is is an option. This is not something that only weird kids that just stay at home all the time just do. It's these are regular people. This is what they like to do. You know, they have regular lives. Now, I think you probably I think I probably already know the answer to this question just based off what you said, but who or what might have stopped you from realizing your full potential as a designer? I think realistically the only thing that would have stopped me would have been me, really. Because once I sort of got the the itch for it, Mm -hmm. I was focused. Like, that was what I wanted to do. Like, I spent so much time on my computer at home, it was just sort of frightening. Like, does he come outside? Like, we see him every now and then. (laughs) What what the hell is he doing? Mm -hmm. And... Like, it was what I was determined to learn. Unless there was, like, something that really became so much more of a passion to me than this, I don't think there would have been anything that would have necessarily stopped me. I think I would have kept, I would have ignored any sort of other thing to continue on this path. How do you keep motivated and inspired? I think... Nowadays, it's easier for me to to stay inspired and motivated because technology changes so much faster than it did in the past. Like before it was, oh, I heard about XYZ technology coming out. Maybe I'll eventually see a magazine article in a couple months about it. And maybe a couple months after that, there'll be a book I can read on it. But now it's like, okay, we figured out how to do this. Uh, we figured this out at 8 a.m. An article's published on it, like, at 8 p.m., and by the end of the week, people are already, like, writing tutorials on how it's done. So there's just so much new stuff going on. There's so many new sort of ideas springing up that you mm-hmm. constantly see all of these things that, like, oh, yeah, you know, that's a good idea, but what if I did this instead of that? Would that work for me? It, there's, like, a constant sort of flow of of ideas because there's so many other ideas floating around you Uh you just have to sort of keep your eyes open to what's you know basically going on around you because there's just so much out there that is just unexplored and untapped like that's why these these little small startups get bought up out here so quickly because they were the first one to come up with this idea that everybody was sort of like thinking of, but maybe they had a spin on it that worked just right for another company. And like, okay, we're going to buy them because this is exactly what we want to do. And it's Mm -hmm. different than how everybody else was sort of picturing it. 
sort of like how Google just snaps up little startups here and there. I think that might be another, there might be another reason behind that. <laughs> I just think they might not want to put that work in internally. Like, hey, if we can bring them in, then we can sort of figure this out after the fact. That's not to say that, that that's not working out for them, but I think they snap them up so they don't have to do it necessarily internally from the start. They can just sort of have a platform to develop off of. Yeah. Now, you mentioned earlier, you said that, you know, you're very fortunate to sort of come up in the in the design scene and the companies that you worked at without any sort of problems or anything like that. Do you think that recruitment might also sort of be an issue? out there in the in the Bay Area because there's so many designers and so many people vying for the same types of positions? Yes. I think recruitment is sort of, it's a big headache. At the same time, it is a blessing because I can switch, you know, I can switch one option on LinkedIn and I'll get like 50 emails by the end of the week. Um, mm-hmm. And it just keeps coming. It keeps coming. At the same time, you know that those same 50 emails probably went to, like, 50 other people. Right. So you have to make sure that – and this is part of why I say make sure you know more than just design or can at least speak about more than just design because somebody else is going to have one thing on their resume that one of these companies is going to like that's going to X you out of the running – even if they're not like an expert on it, but they know how to talk about, you know, whatever it is. If they know how to talk about CSS or they went to WWDC and attended a, a talk and learned about something that this company is sort of in line to build. Or they heard about a programming language and during the interview they speak about it, they're instantly going to have the leg up on you. So... Right. In order to sort of fight that recruitment fight, you have to make sure you can stand out amongst the wave of people coming in vying for that same position because there's a lot of people flooding into the bay because this is the this is the tech hub at the moment. Yeah. Who has offered you the most useful career advice and what was that advice? I would say it would have to be, and this is someone who I should have mentioned as one of my mentors, um, okay. Elliot Thompson, who I, wor- I worked under him at AOL uh, on the sports team. And basically, he sort of quickly gave me an insight into the whole sort of industry of design and tech and things like that. And his, I mean... He didn't tell me any, like, he didn't give me any specific piece of advice other than to just do what it is that you do to the best of your ability, and it'll shine, because he could see in me that the talent was there, and I just needed the opportunity, so I, that I just needed to keep doing what I was doing, and pretty much it would, anything that I was looking for would come to me, Mm -hmm. and I mean, realistically, that's advice that anyone can follow. They just need to, some people just need to be told. It's in the beginning, it's going to be sort of difficult. You're going to think that, oh, these other designers are so much better than me. No, you got hired for a particular reason. You have skills. Someone saw those skills and that talent in you. You can do it as long as you stick with it. You don't let other things pressure you and sway your opinion. You have to just keep doing what you're doing to the best of your ability. And it'll happen. Don't worry. It will happen. Just don't let it sort of crush your dreams because the valley in the tech industry is a fickle thing. Like you could be working for a company that you think is the best thing in the world and the next week they can just be gone and you're out on your ass and you don't know what happened. And sometimes that'll affect you. Like, was it that my design was not good enough for, you know, our company to get noticed or something like that? No, that's just how it happens sometimes. It's a business and sometimes businesses go away, but you just got to stay focused. Are you where you wanted to be at this stage in your life? I think I am. I mean, 
I would like to have a lot more money, but <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't we all, right? <laughs> but I mean, realistically, I am at this point in my life where I would like to be as far as my career. Uh, but I mean, I've I've got aspirations for more. But I think at, if I was to look back and say, by X period of time, I want to be doing such and such work, I'm pretty much on track at this point. Mm-hmm. Well, let's switch gears a little bit, sort of go off of work and design and just talk more about about you as a person. Uh, do you have any plans for this summer? Oh, boy, this summer, not really. <laughs> um, I mean, I've been traveling a lot more lately, which is also something a lot of people should do, travel. Travel, travel, mm-hmm. travel. I know people like to, you know, oh, I'm going to go to the beach that's like an hour away. No, go to another state, go to another country, go see something you haven't seen. Look on Discovery Channel or National Geographic or something and see something that is beautiful that you've never seen and go to that place and see it. So I would say I may randomly decide to travel somewhere. I'm thinking I may go see Vancouver again. It's actually very, very beautiful. Last time I was there was only for work for a short period of time so I didn't get to see as much of it as I would have liked to but I think that might be a a, a plan other than that it's mostly going to see different music festivals and riding my bike (laughs) what music are you listening to these days oh boy that is a thing I have so (laughs) much music I just, I basically just put it on random all the time. I'm like constantly discovering old music. I'm constantly rediscovering music that I didn't realize that I had or purchased or old sort of tracks on record that I never sort of listened to and rediscovering how good they actually are. So I'm listening to a lot of stuff. <laughs> and, I mean, I can't, I can't go through a work day without listening to music like I've taken the train into work and like stopped halfway because I forgot my iPod or my headphones or something and just gone back gone back home yeah I've gone back and got it yeah Yeah. I've done that too and called in like oh the train was late I've done that too I don't know what you're talking about (laughs) (laughs) well I think designers and music really tend to go you know sort of hand in hand because music can really serve as that inspiration you can zone out to good music music can put you in a certain mood to design something so i, I totally I understand definitely that put you in a different headspace like sometimes different music will affect your sort of thought process sometimes if i'm trying to power through something that needs to be done by end of day it'll be something faster but uh-huh. if it's like the beginning of the day and i'm trying to figure out a problem then it might be something slower or you know like something like classical music or things like that so yeah it it definitely helps in different phases of the day depending on what mood i need to be in to get work done for me lately i'd say probably within the past few months and this is something that i've done before but it's been video game music specifically video game music from Final Fantasy IV, the boss theme. <laughs> like, there's two boss themes. There's, like, the regular boss theme, and then there's, like, the huge boss theme. And the huge boss theme is, like, super bombastic. It's, like, verdi. It's, like, there's kettle drums and violins and everything. And it's, like, I'm just going through my list, just getting shit done. Like, bam, 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 bam. So, yeah, absolutely, totally, I know what you mean. I understand that I listen to some video game music, and and surprisingly, so movie scores are actually very good as well, as well as anime. <laughs> anime music is also good. Uh-huh. It's it's surprisingly well done. I mean, oh yeah, like some of the more poppy stuff I tend to ignore, but like the stuff where it's like more instrumental and sort of has a mood to it that's supposed to be given to you during a specific scene, actually uh-huh. sort of helps me sort of set a mood in my head as well so it it does the job for years for me it was the soundtrack to evangelion that's like a very good one (laughs) for years like it like asuka's theme or misato's theme or the whole ray's theme like if i just need to get into like a clear 
kind of mind space. Like, yeah, absolutely. The uh, music for Cowboy Bebop is also exceptionally good. It's you know, oh yes, yes, all, yes. All the jazzy tracks are just. It could be released as like a standalone thing, separate from the anime, and I think people would actually like it if they didn't know it was attached to an anime. They would love it. Oh yeah, I think she has done that because Yoko Kano, the group that she was with when she did those tracks, was called the Seatbelts. Yeah, like Japanese jazz group. I think they did do. I mean, I'm pretty sure they've had like standalone Cowboy Bebop albums. There was another series that she was a part of called Kids on the Slope. Yes. That was all like jazz, sort of set in like I guess fifties Japan, like rural Japan, which has I mean I think like more modern interpretations of classic jazz pieces. But yeah, the the Cowboy Bebop soundtrack is is really timeless in that respect. It's really good. You talked about travel a lot. If you had to live somewhere else, where would it be? If I had to live somewhere else, it would be. It would either be Japan or it would be probably London. Japan, I am pretty enamored with the culture and the history and sort of the scenery. I like anime and I like video games, so that that's sort of a given. But yeah. there's just there's such a depth to their culture and history that it's just I see pictures of you know, from people's travel, and it's like, this is like a beautiful place I would love to see. I'm sure if I saw it in person, it would be this transcending moment where I would be inspired to do something. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But London is just someplace I've always wanted to spend some time. And living there would give me access to other countries a lot easier than being in the United States. So I, you know, I could hop a train and be in France in a day. So mm-hmm. that would that would be an optimal sort of setup. In what ways are you still kind of the same creative person that you were as a child? I still sketch a lot. I sketch like and I don't necessarily like doing characters and stuff like that, but you know, before I I when I was younger and doing like character drawing and stuff like that, I would sketch everything out multiple times before I finally figured one that I was going to pin and and scan and color. And now when I'm doing design for web or for mobile, I sketch out everything before I finally sort of take things into Photoshop and things like that. So like my process still has a basis that I've followed for years. Mm -hmm. I would also say that I am still willing to try sort of crazy things to accomplish a task. Like if I think that we should totally revise something because I think it's crap, I will take time out to write down why I think it's crap and then argue the point, even though I probably shouldn't be as blunt about things as I am. Uh, (laughs) Sometimes that works the best just like you kind of have to speak up uh you can't be afraid because if you have an opinion there's the only person that may think it's invalid is you and that doesn't necessarily mean that's the case you might have a brilliant idea or somebody may be able to play off of an idea you have so be willing to take risk even if you fail it's not necessarily the end of the world you know you tried So Mm -hmm. be just upfront about what your ideas are and what you want to see something become. And that's sort of what I I try to continue to do. Like if I don't like something, I pretty much will say outright that this is, this is a stupid idea. I will question why are we doing this? I'll question it repeatedly while I am still doing the stupid thing I'm being asked to do. (laughs) So (laughs) I'm not going to not do the work, but I am going, to uh-huh. continue to stress that I do not think this is a good idea. Do you think that might get misconstrued? Yes, you kind of have to test, <laughs> test how far you can go with that because there is a limit. And yes, it can get you in trouble. You can't necessarily just go up to like an, a developer and like, oh, this is stupid. Why did you do this? You kind of have to be political about it. There's a way of going about being blunt without being an asshole about it. Mm -hmm. Like you can have 
opinion supported by fact cannot be, well, it can be denied. It is happening and being denied every day in the news. But realistically, fact, <laughs> fact cannot be ignored. So, like, if you have analytics that says, oh, this is a bad idea, or you have, like, even industry trends that says, oh, this is not what we should do, this is probably going to get ignored, or this is the way our user base is moving, Mm -hmm. then they can't ignore it for so long unless they want to set themselves up for failure. So as long as you, like, you don't have to sort of beat people over the head with it, but if you have the facts to back it up, it just really, it can't be ignored, Right. Basically, just make sure you've got your facts straight. Yes. Gotcha. If you weren't doing design, what do you think you would be doing? If I wasn't doing design... Would you be sketching? I know you... I would... I, yeah, I, I think if I wasn't doing design, I would have gone into animation, something along those lines, because that was... Like, when I was younger, before I really got into computers, all I did was read comic books and draw superheroes and different figures and things like that. And I think at Mm. at one point I wanted to do that. So I think I probably, had I not sort of been introduced to the technology aspect of it, I think I would have stayed in sort of a general art sort of animation sort of field. Where do you see yourself in the next five years? In the next five years, I hope to have finally attained the level of of art director or creative director. And that's mainly because I'm getting to a point in design where I don't think I have much more that I need to prove to myself that I can do. I've done websites. I've done, you know, mobile applications. I've done advertisement. I've done photography. I've done all these things. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm getting to the point where I want to sort of be that guy that can sort of mentor or guide someone else to attain the same level of sort of accomplishment. I want to say, okay, you've got a great idea. This is the way you need to go with that idea and sort of see that to a successful end. Not necessarily just for myself, but for them as well, so they can make that check mark on their list of things that they've accomplished. I still want to be sort of in design, but I don't necessarily think that I'll always be that hands-on guy doing all of the design. I think Mm -hmm. I'm going to, over time, move into more of sort of the director role where I'm mentoring or guiding a, a product, but letting someone else sort of put their idea or spin on it and see what they can make out of it and how they can grow their career out of it. Are you doing any kind of mentoring like that now? Right now, I'm actually trying to take some courses on management and things like that. I will say one positive thing that I did get out of college was spending all of my electives on psychology classes (laughs) because understanding people's thought process and how people make decisions and how people interpret particular things that you put in front of them is Mm -hmm. very, very, very helpful in design because you'll find that you're going to need to do A-B testing from time to time, but being able to sort of think as a user would or see problems becomes a lot easier when you understand people's thought process. So you sort of... I think avoid a little bit more of the headaches that you would down the line, Mm -hmm. understanding how people outside of yourself or outside of the bubble of your office or the bubble of your area might be thinking about this because that's the reality is your user base is not necessarily you. It's going to be everybody else except you possibly. And you have to know how they think think and how they work and how they sort of problem solve so Mm -hmm. you can't you can't design for yourself because of course you know how to work your app or how to use your page perfectly but that doesn't necessarily equate to the rest of the world i think a lot of companies particularly small businesses need to hear that you can't design for yourself i can't tell you how many client meetings i've been in and i've presented the data and told them what they need to do but They're designing it for them, or not just for themselves, but like for the people in their office 
like other people outside of that doesn't really matter. I think more people need to hear that you're not just designing for yourself. So, well, just to kind of wrap up this interview, where can our audience find you online? I can be found on Twitter at T zero F U tofu with a zero. <laughs> I'm on okay. Instagram. Sometimes Eric, I think it's sometimes underscore Eric. Uh, uh, I'm sure you'll figure it out. I'm on Facebook, but I'm sort of not on Facebook. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but um, <laughs> my website is badtofu.com. And for the most part, it's just photography, uh, which is mostly put on there. It's, it's, it's what I do in my free time. One thing that I would like to stress to designers and developers is find a hobby outside of design. It will be the greatest thing that you can do for yourself because you really, really, really need that mental break from time to time. And to have something else to focus on helps you sort of shut down that part of your brain and rest. So on the weekends, basically, if I am not going to meet up with people, I'm either doing photography work or I'm just riding my bike because either of those two is like an instant head clear because I have to think about photography totally different than I do from design work. And with cycling, it's just like an exercise. Normally people can zone out and clear their head of things. But you'll find that you can come back, you can have a problem, step away from it, do whatever else it is that you're passionate about, and then come back to that problem. And you'll have a clearer head about maybe how you should go about solving it. Or while you're in the middle of that other action, it may come to you suddenly. But you just need something to sort of shut off that design development portion of your head for a little bit of time. And you'll be a better designer or developer for it. I like that advice. That's good advice. Eric Johnson, thank you so much uh, for taking time out of your day for this interview. I think you you dropped a lot of good little nuggets in the interview. Dropping them gems. Yeah, drop some gems, yeah. Yeah. Like you're saying, like, do what you do to the best of your ability. You were saying you can't design just for yourself. There's a lot in here that I think people are going to get some good information from. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. No problem. I, I enjoyed it. And that's it for this week. Big thanks to Eric Johnson and thanks to you for listening. Eric had some really, really great advice about following your passions and working to the best of your ability. It was a really great conversation. Don't forget to check out MailChimp.com, sign up for a free account, and take your email marketing to the next level. Also, check out AudibleTrial.com forward slash Revision Path and sign up for their free 30-day trial and free audio book from their library of over 150,000 books. Revision Path is a 318 media project. If you like what we're doing with these interviews and with the website, then show your support. Visit tugboatyards.com forward slash page forward slash revision path and donate today. Thanks so much for listening and we'll see you next time.